I have a question for you. On the screen is an app. It's nothing fancy, just a Lambda function that expects some data from an SQS queue, which it would then write to an S3 bucket. My question to you is, how would you deploy this? A simple answer is to log on to AWS, navigate the sea of acronyms until you find the services you want, click a few buttons to configure and deploy each service, upload an artifact of the code, configure the environment variables, the SQS trigger, and IAM access, test it a couple of times, and you're good. It's not a bad answer at all. It's a little point and click heavy for my tastes, but it gets the job done. However, there is a potential problem. For example, let's say you just managed to complete the previous steps. You're ready to relax, take an early lunch, and then suddenly I drop you a Slack message with another version that I'd like you to deploy. At this point, you'll probably realize that I'm just gonna keep pushing you work. So as the smart developer that you are, you are gonna wanna start automating some of this. You can write this yourself using either the AWS API or the AWS CLI or even some of the SDKs. However, there is another approach, one that has forever changed the way that I deploy code. You could use a tool called Terraform. Terraform is an infrastructure as code tool that lets you build, change, and version cloud resources safely and efficiently. Terraform isn't the only tool that provides the ability to do infrastructure as code, but it's probably the most ubiquitous. So we're gonna focus on it in this video, but I will be doing videos on the other tooling out there. So what is infrastructure as code? Infrastructure as code, or IAC, is the idea that you can use code to define your infrastructure in a declarative manner. But what does declarative mean? Well, instead of writing code to perform iterative or procedural actions based on the current state of your environment, you instead describe what the expected state of your environment should look like, and Terraform will perform the necessary changes in order to achieve it. This means your code defines only the relevant information about your system, rather than defining control flows such as state reconciliation or error handling. As the infrastructure of a system becomes more complex, this declarative manner helps to keep the definition concise and understandable. The second benefit that IAC brings is that it provides a deterministic and repeatable method for managing infrastructure. This means that in theory, tearing down an entire environment and rebuilding it is possible in just two steps. But uh, please don't do this in production, as there are some caveats around this, especially concerning data. The third benefit I think is worth mentioning is that it allows your infrastructure changes to be version controlled. By checking in your code into a version control system such as Git, you get all of the benefits that brings, such as being able to have your IAC reviewed by other developers and having a log of changes that have been made to your environment. You're also able to share your infrastructure with others like you would code. Perhaps even more powerfully, you can also apply automation. For example, rather than having to manually deploy any changes I make to my Lambda function each time I make them, I can instead just set up a continuous deployment pipeline to apply my changes whenever I make a commit to my main branch. By doing this, it reduces the time and effort required from code being written to it being deployed. Okay, so hopefully I've done a good job of explaining the value of infrastructure as code, and you're feeling inspired to give it a try. If not, then it's a good job no one is sponsoring this video. Either way, let's actually write some Terraform to gain a better understanding of how it all works. Remember the code I asked you to mentally deploy earlier? Well, let's deploy it using Terraform. The first thing we're gonna to want to do is to install Terraform. I actually recommend using a tool called TFMV, which allows us to manage different versions of Terraform. On Mac, you can do so using brew install TFMV and on Linux, whatever your distro uses. I'm using Arch, by the way, so I'll install using Yay. With TFMV installed, go ahead and install the same Terraform version I am, which is 1.4.6. You can try a more recent version if you like, but your mileage may vary. With the necessary software installed, you'll also need to have your AWS credentials set up. And for this, you'll need an AWS account. If you're unsure how to obtain your credentials, you can get them by heading over to the I am section of AWS and pulling them from there. I recommend creating a new programmatic access only user as it's good hygiene to not have your root user's credentials exposed. We could actually create our user using IAC, but it leaves us with a bit of a chicken and egg situation. Either way, it's not a huge issue. Terraform does allow us to import existing resources into the state. So let's create that resource manually at this time. For this user, I've attached them the administrator access policy, which gives them admin access across the entire account. This isn't the best practice, and in production, you'd really want to restrict this. With the user created, click on their name and head on over to the Security Credentials tab. Here, we'll generate access credentials that we'll be able to use with Terraform. 
go through the necessary steps until you end up on the same screen that I am. Here you'll have your access key ID and secret. You'll want to copy both of these values into a credentials file for AWS. This credentials file is stored at home.aws slash credentials with the following format as I have on screen. Make sure to actually use the secret key value instead of the placeholder that I'm using. Just a quick security disclaimer, you'll want to delete this user at the end of this tutorial or at the very least adjust the security permissions to no longer have admin access. Using full admin access is a bad practice, but it's just to keep this tutorial as simple as possible. Okay, with all of that done, we're now ready to write some code. The first thing we're gonna do is clone the project files into a new directory. You can do this yourself to follow along and the command is in the description. With the project downloaded, open it up in your favorite text editor and jump on over to the infrastructure directory. Here is where the magic is going to happen. Inside of the infrastructure directory is where all of our IAC will live. You'll notice we have a number of files in here with the extension .tf, which is the file extension for Terraform. The three files we have are terraform.tf, which has our Terraform provider configuration, variables.tf, which defines any Terraform variables we're using, and main.tf, which is where our resource definitions will live. If you open up the terraform.tf file, you can see the providers that we're using. You can think of providers as being similar to packages or dependencies. And in this file, we're defining which dependencies we're using and their versions. These dependencies are HashiCorp slash AWS, which is the official AWS provider from HashiCorp, HashiCorp slash random, which is a provider for generating random values, and HashiCorp slash archive, which is a provider used for managing archives of files. By the way, HashiCorp is the creator of Terraform. These are the necessary providers we're going to use in this video. If you jump over to the variables.tf file, you'll see that we have one variable defined, which is the AWS region that we're using. As I'm based in the US, I'll be using US East 1 region, but you should change this to the one that is closer to your location, if you like. Finally, we can jump on over to our main.tf file, which is where our infrastructure resources will be provisioned. We currently only have a single resource defined at the moment, which is used to generate a random four word name. We'll use this resource later on, but let me show you what it does. If you jump over to the terminal, we can go ahead and create our single resource. First, navigate to the infrastructure directory and type in terraform init to initialize our state and download any providers. Once that's done, you can then type in terraform plan, which will show you the changes that will occur when we apply our configuration. These changes are derived from our current state versus our expected state. In our case, you can see that a single resource of random pet.lambda bucket name is going to be created. One thing to note is that Terraform can't derive every change beforehand and sometimes needs an apply to actually resolve values. This usually happens for things such as IDs or in our case, our randomly generated name. You can see this defined as known after apply. The next command is Terraform apply, which will create, update and destroy resources in order to meet our desired state from our current one. Basically, it will apply the changes we saw in our plan. Let's go ahead and run this. When running apply, Terraform will show you the changes that the apply will make. If everything looks good, type the word yes in the prompts and press enter to continue. We can see in the output that our resource has been created. If we run Terraform plan again, we'll see that there are no changes to be made. Well, that's because our current Terraform state matches our configuration. About the Terraform state, by the way, if you look in the current directory, you'll see a terraform.tf state file in there. This is where the current state is stored, which is unfortunately local. This isn't ideal for the long term as you'll probably want this in a remote and centralized place. One option is S3, which is actually pretty easy to configure in Terraform, but we'll save that for another video. By the way, you might be wondering what random name our resource generated. Well, we can actually view this by inspecting the state file. If you run the following command of Terraform state show random pet dot lambda bucket name, Terraform will then show you the resource as it exists in the state file. And here you can actually see the random name, which in my case is positively currently able cod. Okay, so I think there is one last command worth going over, and that is the destroy command. The destroy command will tear down any resources in your Terraform state. To run the destroy command, you just type in Terraform destroy. After a short while, Terraform will show you the changes that are going to be made, which is going to be deleting every resource. This is what we're expecting, so go ahead and type yes in the prompt. Now if we run Terraform plan again, we can see that we're starting from scratch. Okay, sweet, so that covers the basics, but we really didn't create anything other than a random name. 
let's go ahead and actually deploy some infrastructure. To help visualize what we're going to deploy, I've drafted up a diagram of what our expected infrastructure should look like. Here we have our message queue, which is going to be SQS. The user will send messages or data to the SQS queue. The next component we have is our Lambda function, which will read messages off the SQS queue using an event mapping. This Lambda will then write those messages into our final component, our S3 bucket. The messages will be stored with the message ID from SQS. Yes, I know this is kind of pointless, but bear with me. This is just to help represent a non-trivial app that has multiple dependencies. So let's start our infrastructure as code from the components that have the least amount of dependencies, one of which is our S3 bucket. Heading back over to our main.tf file, let's add in the S3 bucket resource. We can do this by calling the resource keyword followed by the resource type of AWS S3 bucket. The last thing to add to this line is the name we wish to give our resource. Let's go with lambda underscore bucket. This name is only for our Terraform state and not for our actual S3 bucket that's being created. Okay, inside our resource block, let's go and add the bucket name or ID field. We'll set this to be the name that we randomly generated, which will help prevent any bucket naming collisions if you decide to run this yourself. Here is where part of the magic of Terraform happens. Instead of hard coding this name, we're referencing the value of our Lambda bucket name resource, like we would do in code. This creates a dependency graph that Terraform will use to determine the order in which to create resources. As for our S3 resource, we're only setting the bucket field, but there's many others you can set. If you want to know more about what fields you can configure, HashiCorp provides amazing documentation on their providers, which you can view on their website. Heading back to our terminal, now let's run Terraform apply and inspect what's gonna be created. Everything looks as expected, so let's go ahead and type yes in the prompt and wait for Terraform to do its thing. Once Terraform is done, we can confirm that our bucket is created, both by using the AWS CLI with the AWS S3 LS command, or by checking the AWS console. With this resource created, we've successfully deployed the first component of our infrastructure, the S3 bucket. Let's move on to our next resource, which is going to be the SQS queue. Similar to our S3 bucket, let's define our resource, which will be an AWS SQS queue, and we'll call it message queue. Next, we'll set the name value to be dreams of code IAC queue. Unlike our S3 bucket, this name is account scope, so we shouldn't get any conflicts. This is all we're gonna set in this video, but in a production system, you probably wanna configure a few more things. If you want to know more about configuring SQS, then let me know in the comments down below. Let's go ahead and run Terraform apply again. Everything looks good in the plan changes, so we're gonna type yes. This might take a little while to create, so now is a good time to make sure you're hydrated. Once that's done, we can check that our SQS queue exists in both the AWS CLI with the AWS SQS list queues command, or by checking the AWS console under the SQS page. The final piece of the infrastructure puzzle is the Lambda function, which is going to be the most exciting. We actually have a few resources we need to create here. The first step is to create an archive of our binary to deploy. I've kept this binary in the repo, but you shouldn't ever blindly trust anything you download on the internet. I recommend to rebuild the code yourself just to be safe. If you really do trust me and don't want to bother installing Go, then you can just skip the following steps, but I really advise against this. To build from source, make sure you have at least Go version 1.20 and make installed on your system. Then head over to the source directory in the project. Here you can just run the make build command, which will create the binary in the directory we need which is the bin directory at the project root. Now we can jump back over to our main.tf file and use the data keyword of type archive file with the name lambda zip. Notice that we use the data keyword instead of the resource keyword. The data keyword defines a data source, which is typically something that is not managed by Terraform, but Terraform can still make a reference to it. In this block, we'll also need to add the type, which will be a zip and the source file, followed by the output path. Now, if we apply these changes, we should see Terraform zip up our binary. Okay, so we have an archive of our code that we can push into a Lambda function. To do so, we first need to set up some IAM roles, however. IAM is the Identity and Access Management Service of AWS. It basically determines role-based access management to different services within the AWS ecosystem. Setting up IAM access is a little bit tedious, but don't worry, I'll try to get through it as quick as possible. All of this is going to be in a new file called IAM.tf. We basically need to create a role for our Lambda to assume, and we need to give it permissions to write objects to S3 via the put object action, and to both consume and delete messages from our SQS queue. 
It will also need the basic Lambda execution permissions so we can view logs and metrics. We also need to set up a policy in our S3 bucket to allow the Lambda function to perform actions against it. If you don't want to type all of this out, which is understandable, there's a link to the IAM infrastructure in the description below. Otherwise, just copy what I'm putting on the screen and you should be good. Once the file is in place, go ahead and apply it and you can see all the resources being created. Okay, now that that's done, we can move on to creating our Lambda. Let's head back to our main.tf and add in a new resource type of AWS Lambda function. And we'll call it Funky. Here we'll set the name of the function to Dreams of Code IAC Funk, and then we'll set the file name we want to upload to be our archive we created earlier. Next, we set the runtime, which is go1.x. And we'll set the handler, which for a Go app is just the binary file name. We can then set the Lambda role to be the one we just created in our IAM. We can also set the source code hash field using an inbuilt Terraform function. Finally, we need to set the memory size and the timeout, which is in seconds. Let's be generous here and set it to 128 megabytes and a timeout of 10 seconds. The last thing to add is any environment variables. If you check the code, you can see that we're expecting the bucket name variable to be set. This is so the code knows which S3 bucket to save the data to. Let's go ahead and add this variable and link it to our S3 bucket resource. With our Lambda function added, we can now run Terraform apply to create it. Once the command is complete, if we check the AWS console, we can see our Lambda function has been created. But we're not finished yet. We have one last thing to do, which is to assign our SQS queue as an event trigger for our Lambda function. This is pretty simple to do and requires creating another resource of AWS Lambda event source mapping. And here we just set the event source ARN to be our SQS queue and the Lambda function to be our newly created Lambda resource. We're also going to set the batch size to one, otherwise we'll be waiting a whole minute for anything to happen. You probably don't want to do this in production, however, unless you have a very good reason. Let's type in our favorite command, terraform apply, check the changes, and type yes. And with that, our infrastructure should be completely deployed. I'll show you how to test these changes, both using the AWS CLI and the AWS console. First, we'll use the CLI. To send a message to our app via the AWS CLI, you can use the SQS send message command. Make sure to adjust the region and select the correct queue URL as per your account. If you're not sure what your queue URL is, you can run the AWS SQS list queues command again. Then you want to set the message payload, which in this case is hello YouTube. Once that's completed, we can check our S3 bucket for any files using the S3 LS command. Once we see the file in there, we can download it using the s3cp command, and once that's done, check the contents using cat. As we can see, it's the same message payload we sent. To check using the AWS console, first navigate over to SQS and click on the Dreams of Code IAC queue. Here you should see a button on the top right for sending and receiving messages. Click that button, and then on the next page you should see a text field. Enter in your message into this field and click the Send Message button on the top right. Now navigate over to the S3 page. In this area, we should see our bucket with the Dreams of Code prefix. Click that bucket and you should be greeted with a single file inside. Download and open the file and you should see the payload we just sent. With that, we've confirmed everything is working, but before we're done, we better just tidy up our resources. To tidy everything up, first delete any files in your S3 bucket and then run a Terraform destroy in your infrastructure folder. This will prevent us from incurring any charges. It's also a good idea to delete the AWS user we created for Terraform. You can do this in the IAM section on the AWS website. And with that, we've managed to turn the deployment of our app into infrastructure as code using Terraform. The next time someone asks you how to deploy something, you might be able to teach them something new. I hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you on the next one.